If you have your Bible tonight, I'd invite you to turn to the Gospel of Luke. Uh, this is where we will be kind of through the remainder of Lent as we uh, get ready for Easter. Well, yeah, like the Gospel of Luke. Uh, today in chapter 22, Luke 22, and I'm going to read from verses 54 through 65. 54 through 65. It says, Then they seized him, that is Jesus, and they led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, You are one of them. But Peter said, Man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour still, another insisted, saying, Certainly this man was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, Man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, Before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. But the men who were holding Jesus in custody were mocking him as they beat him. They also blindfolded him and kept him as, and kept blindfolded him and kept asking him, Prophesy, who is it that struck you? And they said many other things against him, blaspheming him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, bow your heads with me and let us pray. Father, would you speak to us now for we are listening? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. 5,584. 5, 5,584. I asked earlier to those who were here, what's significant about that number? It's not just the number of eggs that we'll need. <laughs> not just that we have to provide, but with all the churches together to have a super fun Easter egg hunt. It's actually the number of days that I have had a Facebook account. 5,584 days. Which, as of like three months ago, is over half of my life. I want y'all to think about that. Some of y'all have Facebook now. Some of you don't, and that's okay. Some of you do, and you might have had it for three, four, five, maybe ten years. For me, 15. 15 years, over 15 years I've had a Facebook account. And sometimes uh, Facebook, you know, it reminds you about things that you posted a long time ago. And, uh, you know, so there's this, there's this like semi-permanent public accounting of my adolescence and emerging adulthood that's available. Not everyone can see it, but that I can see. And, you know, sometimes I see those old posts and I think, I'm actually kind of struck, like, that's the same Ryan then that I am today, you know, a little bit of different, but I see the same cares, the same impulses. That's kind of remarkable. But that's not the feeling I have most of the time. Most of the time, I see something that I shared or posted or wrote, whatever, 15 years ago, 14 years ago, 10 years ago, and I just cringe. It's painful. And I want to take it back. <laughs> I want to, and mercifully, I have the privilege today that I can delete a lot of stuff or I can make it private you know so not everyone can see it but yeah it, I want to I want to deny that I want to take it back but there are things in our life associations we have relationships we have beliefs that we share that we can't simply click delete on okay and the thing about like, whenever I was 16 in high school you know we were all getting Facebook for the first time it was brand new and our teachers who didn't have a clue what was going on but they knew to tell us like listen if you put something online it's online it's out there it's in the wild you know and uh, again I'm, now that I'm you know half of my lifetime late you know uh, uh, from that I, I just kidding, I shiver but we want to delete things but we can't always do that in our lives and as we read our passage today, we have to confront the reality uh, that of the fear that, bear, of the, bearing witness to Jesus, uh, the, the, whenever we have a fear of that, and also we have to confront the temptation that we have from time to time to deny Jesus. 
So remember, our approach to this study is going to be threefold. We're going to focus on Jesus, focus on his sufferings and his saving work for us. We're also going to focus on his disciples and the and how we can learn from their actions, whether good or bad, and 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 our uh, how we respond to Jesus. Hold on, just a second. I can tell there's a lot of crackling going on. Uh, you said. And uh, finally, that we would grow in humility as we consider the lowliness of Jesus in these scenes. So uh, Jesus is taken away at the beginning. He's taken by them, it says, which is the chief priests, the officers of the temple, and uh, the scribes, the elders, it says in verse 52. He's taken into the high priest's home, the high priest's palace, and Peter follows, but at a distance. And already from Peter's response, he's fulfilling the person that the psalmist cries out against in Psalm 38 verse 11. There the psalmist is crying out for God's justice and he says, My friends and companions stand aloof from my plague and my nearest kin stay far off. So Peter's following, but he's keeping his distance. He's trying to guard himself. And I think that physical distance that Peter keeps is representative of the spiritual distance that's at the present there between him and Jesus. Okay, uh, between himself and the purpose of God. So, but starting off tonight, I want us to consider Peter and his denial. I want us to linger here for a minute. Because this is the last time that we really linger on any other person besides Jesus uh, until his resurrection. It's this, uh, after this scene, all the, all the disciples are kind of put onto the side. They're, we're going to focus solely on Jesus. So let's think about this discipleship. Peter, this fisherman from Galilee, one of the twelve, an intimate companion of Jesus, who, let's think about what Peter has seen. He's seen Jesus heal the sick. We're told not just any sick people, but particularly his own mother-in-law in Luke chapter 4. This is Peter who saw Jesus walk on water and actually got out of the boat and walked with him. Peter who... Uh, saw Jesus cast out demons, still the storm with a word of his mouth. Jesus who saw, Peter who saw Jesus take a couple loaves and fishes and feed multitudes, not once, but twice. This is what Peter saw. And moreover than seeing the miracles of Jesus, he saw Jesus' glory revealed at the transfiguration in Luke chapter 9. So they go up on the mountain and he sees Jesus glowing and the glory of the Lord shining through him. Uh, he saw who Jesus was, and yet even Peter denies Jesus three times. How is this possible? How can someone who'd be so close to Jesus? Right, and we always ask that. I was talking with a friend this past or a week ago who is a pastor in, in Birmingham, and and he said, I said, you know, how's it going? We were talking about stuff in our churches and. And he said, well, we had you know, someone who was on our pastoral resident team who just, he just left the faith. He, he has renounced the faith totally. And I said, he was a seminary student, right? He said, yeah, he was in seminary and you know, kind of got going on another path, and he, he renounced the faith. So how do we get that where someone who might even say they feel, they feel called to ministry, right? they feel called to serve in a church for their career full time, so they but like the Spirit has led them to do that. They've decided to pursue theological education. Even that person is not immune. Again, if Peter wasn't immune, none of us are. So I think there are three realities that make this possible. The first is the reality of spiritual warfare. Spiritual <coughs> warfare. Right? The, and the thing about spiritual warfare is it's something that we can't always see. Right? We might see the effects of things, but by, by nature it's something that is unseen to us. Right. Remember what Jesus told Peter, and uh, this is a verse we'll come back to multiple times today in uh, chapter 22, verse 31. Simon, Simon, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. Satan wants to wring Peter out just like he wrung out Job. And I think that in hindsight, this grants Peter an awareness in his letter, 1 Peter 5 verses 8 and 9 he says be on guard because satan your adversary goes roaming around like a lion seeking whom he can devour but 
the spiritual warfare was, was real. Remember what Peter, Jesus instructed Peter to pray? Pray that you might not enter into temptation. That's what we saw last week. And were it not for Jesus' intercession, things surely would have been worse for Peter. Again, this affects us today. And we, again, we, it's easy for us to forget it. Uh, there's a philosopher named Charles Taylor, and he talks about how 500 years ago, if you had dropped into any town anywhere, everyone would have believed in spiritual things. Whether they believed in God or they believed in fairies, they would have believed in something, and they would have assumed that there's a spiritual reality. But roll the tape forward to today, now it seems like if you believe in anything spiritual, you have to justify that to other people. Okay, we, we, and even, if, even for people of faith, it's something that they have to consciously enter into. It's something that they have to uh, own, and it's something that they have to defend. Right? He says we live in an imminent frame. That is, we live in a world where basically what we see and you know, but what I can see within my own frame of vision and reference, that's what reality is. And we actually have to remind ourselves, also, but there's more than that. There's more than that. There's more than that. We forget about spiritual warfare. That's something that the Bible speaks so often about. And it's easy whenever things are bad, especially when they're bad on us, you can you could blame a couple things. You could say, well, the culture is always shifting. and You know, you never know where things are going to go. Or you might say, well, the world is, you know, the values of the world uh, are so crazy. I had someone say to me last week, I don't know how y'all have kids. I wouldn't want to bring kids into this world. And, uh, you know, that's the thing. But the Bible commends us to have a sober awareness that this is the reality, right? That doesn't matter how stable our lives may feel, how good they may be at the moment, that they can be disrupted, that, that there are demonic beings, that there is spiritual forces that are working against us. And therefore, the Apostle Paul encourages us in Ephesians 6 to be praying, suit up with armor of God, uh, that we might uh, resist the evil one whenever he approaches us. Again, if, if Peter could succumb to this, so can we. Uh, so we have to be aware of that. The second is there another factor here is really the prophetic pronouncement of Jesus. So Jesus told Peter, by the time the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. All right, we'll look at this a little bit later, but Jesus is speaking prophetically here. His Peter's failure actually demonstrates that Jesus' words remain, were true. And, and again, I think if we, if we think about other things that Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulation, what do we do whenever that comes true, right? What do we do whenever Jesus says, your bad things are going to happen to you, and then those bad things happen to us? Okay, we might, because again, we... We live in a world where I think just generally, relatively, we don't suffer as much as we did. We would have 100 years ago. Many of us would have, just would have died, right? I told someone today, like I said, 200 years ago, I'd be dead by now. I have diabetes, wouldn't have been able to solve I'd be gone. I said, you know, probably several of my family members would have had things happen where they would have died. Uh, it just, you know, we thankfully have the mercy of, of better of health care and things like that. We, we don't, we're able to live longer, healthier lives. But <clears throat> trials still come. How do we respond? But the third thing, and I think this is the feature that we really see the most on, on Peter. So not only did he fail because of the prophetic word, did he fail because of spiritual warfare, but of his own human weakness. His own human weakness. We can imagine what Peter is feeling in this moment. Right? The person whom he's dedicated the last three years of his life to has just been arrested, hauled off by the people who have authority, and, you know, does he want to be associated with this? You can imagine the weakness that he has. The, you can imagine the fear or maybe even the embarrassment about being associated with this guy. It's one of those things you don't feel it until you're in the moment. And so how do we... He's embarrassed and afraid because of his association with three things. First, with Jesus himself. Let's just walk through the people who say things to Peter. The first is the servant girl in verse uh, 56. It says, Then a servant girl, seeing him... As he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, This man also was with him, but he denied it, saying, Woman, I do not know him. You know, what's interesting is that Peter is afraid. Again, it's not to, this is not a condescending remark about women. It's a historical reflection about this girl 2,000 years ago. She would have had 
almost no social status that Peter would have needed to be threatened by. Right, and she was a servant girl, maybe a slave, and someone who occupied the bottom rung of society in a society that was very status conscious. So Peter, why does he need to worry about what, you know, what this girl says? You know, she's relatively a nobody. Again, I'm not saying that she is in the eyes of God. I'm just saying socially in that circumstance. But he still denies it. And it makes us think about why would we be tempted to deny Jesus? I can think of a couple circumstances from my own life. Right? Maybe when I was younger in particular in high school, uh, but you still feel it sometimes today, you can be associated with being a goody two-shoes, right? Oh, you follow Jesus means you're kind of soft, you know. I had people, you know, when I was in high school in the cafeteria who would try to get me to say cuss word because they just wanted me to, you know, do something bad, right? I wasn't trying to, I mean, I'm sure I could grow now, you know, 15 years later after I've had Facebook and all, uh, and how I could have represented Jesus then. But, you know, uh, are, you too, are you too good for us? Are you self-righteous? We're not trying to be self-righteous, but whenever we're trying to live holy lives, people will accuse us of that. Or maybe you're around somebody who's really smart, and they have intellectual objections to the faith that they lob bombs at. This is what happened to my friend and uh, the, the guy at his church in Birmingham. Yeah, you, you'll, you know, what if uh, someone comes and they start asking you a bunch of questions that you don't even have answers for? You didn't even know you needed to have answers for. Right? Sometimes you might be a little embarrassed by that. You don't want to seem as someone who's uneducated. Or maybe we find ourselves, and here's where I think our actions can deny who Jesus is. We find ourselves where following Jesus puts us at an inconvenience. Okay? Right? Because I follow Jesus, there are certain ways that I'm not going to make money. Okay? I'm not going to go into the casino business because I love Jesus too much for that. Okay? That ruins people's lives. I'm just ethically not going to do that. I'm not going to worry about you know, getting all the signatures I need for this building project because... You know that would take too much time and it's not gonna matter anyway I'm just gonna you know go ahead and start construction right you you kind of do the unethical thing whereas following Jesus would mean you shouldn't do that it would put you at an inconvenience and so you can deny him by your words all right I just guess I won't follow Jesus right now that's that's an issue that uh, Titus chapter 1 verse 16 says they profess to know him by their words but they deny him by their works so the first thing he denies is Jesus. The second thing he denies is the church, namely the fellowship of disciples. It says in verse 58, a little later, someone else saw him and said, you are one of them. Peter said, man, I am not. So now, first he denied knowing Jesus. Now he denies his association with the other disciples. And I want you to think about who these people are. Again, in addition to spending time with Jesus, he had also spent time with these 11 other guys. One of them was his brother, Andrew, some of his closest friends, and yet he denied an association with them. Again, ultimately it's because they too are associated with Jesus, but I want us to think about, have, how, are you ever tempted to deny the fellowship of the saints? Are you tempted to, be, to deny your association with the church? And it kind of goes like this. If you've ever had a kind of a strange or an odd family member, you know, we all have, there's the stereotypical kind of crazy uncle. I don't really have a crazy uncle, but you know, that's the, apparently according to the movies, we all have one, okay? You have someone who's a little odd and, you know, family gatherings go, you kind of, you know, meet in another part of the house. Uh, you can be embarrassed by them. You don't want to be associated with them. Uh, sometimes that happens with our church community or with Christians, and, and sometimes it's because they're just, maybe there's someone who is socially awkward or odd and you know, you're worried, what are people going to think about me if I'm associated with them? Or maybe, I, I think this happens a lot, people think about how the church affects their social standing in the community, right? It's, 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 it's a far cry to go from, like, First Peter, First Peter, where, like, you know, you all need to endure with the church, even though it's going to cost you everything socially. You need to follow Jesus regardless, too. I, I had friends I had conversations with before, like, they finished their professional schooling and now they're moving to a town and they're trying to think about which church to join because of who they might get connected to in the church, you know. So there's that. And, you know, so, so you know, we want to go to the highfalutin church because some other churches are not good. But, but even, and I, I find this sometimes, there are scandals that happen in the church. You hear about them weekly. 
right? And maybe it's a church that you're familiar with or a leader you're familiar with, maybe not, right? There's this past week have been some big, big names uh, that have had scandals. And I think that there are a lot of people who hear this and they very understandably want to create distance from themselves in that person or that group. Um, if, if a church has, and, and again, it's, it's important because we are a part of the body of Christ. If a church has committed abuse or a leader's committed abuse, uh, that's going to lead people away from the church. And that's one of those really sad things. But, you know, I guess one question to ask is, is our, is our allegiance to the church or is it to Jesus? And if we have a bride, if, if Jesus' bride is imperfect, the church, how do we minister to make it better? Okay, that's the question that I think about. How do we rebuild in those places? Again, we could deny it. We could just say Christians have done some some Christians have done some bad things, and therefore we're going to leave. But uh, we're called to, I think, to work for reform and to do that. But again, I think again thinking about why would you why would we deny why would he deny his fellowship with the disciples? He's embarrassed to be with them. Right? He doesn't want to be known to be with Jesus still. He rejects solidarity for the sake of social mobility within this, even this little group of people he doesn't even really know. And then finally, he's embarrassed, it seems, by his hometown to some degree. Certainly this man also was with him, for he is a Galilean, verse 59. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you're talking about. You know, this, this guy must be with Jesus. He's from the south. Listen to his accent. No, 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 no. I'm not from, I, I don't associate with those people. Right, we don't know how they knew he was a Galilean. It could be that he has a regional accent. Uh, maybe he was wearing certain clothes, or maybe he just looked a certain way. You know, they, some you know people have uh, certain traits that they uh, share. But he still claims ignorance of Jesus. And again, I think we have a temptation to deny that too, to deny where we've come from. Uh, more than the in, in the South, I'll be honest. You have to be a little careful about talking about heritage. Some you talk about that, and some people start waving Confederate flags, and it gets kind of scary. But uh, but I think even the, just our families, and you know, we, if you leave the country to go to the big city, you know, you're kind of glad about that. You may kind of lose your ties to where you've come from. So we can imagine all these things that are contributing to the reason why Peter might have denied Jesus. But I, here's where I think the denial comes in. I did a word study on denial today. And there's two things, two types of denials that happen in the Gospels. One is here, Peter denies Jesus, but the other denial is whenever Jesus, in issuing the call to discipleship, here in Luke chapter 9, verses 33 and 34, 23 and 24, said, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. The choice before Peter is the choice that faces us today. Namely, will we deny ourselves or will we deny Jesus? I think that's what it comes down to. Will we deny ourselves or will we deny Jesus? Peter did not go the way of the cross here. Now, this is not the end of the story. We're going to get to the end of the story later on for Peter. But the, the Bible commentator Joel Green says, everything that was central to Peter's construction of his new identity as a follower of Jesus, he is thrust aside. Right in the end, whenever the rooster crows, the rooster bears more witness to Jesus than Peter has over the last hour. Okay? And this is, again, this is not good for Peter. Jesus, multiple times throughout his ministry, warns about the danger of denying Jesus. If you deny me before men, then I will deny you before my Father in heaven. Jesus says that. So it's one of the most spiritually dangerous things we can do. We can deny him with our words. We can deny him by our works. And this puts us in grave jeopardy before God. It calls into question the authenticity of our salvation. And it puts us, as Peter finds himself, totally at the mercy of Jesus. Right? This, there's a detail that Luke tells us that the other gospel writers don't, talk, don't talk, tell us about. In verse 61, it says, And the Lord turned and looked at Peter. Now, if we didn't know anything about Jesus, we might think that that's a look of condemnation. I don't think Jesus gives those kind of looks. But the Lord looked at Peter. And as he heard the, the rooster crow three times, as he saw the Lord, then he realized what he had done. But I think Jesus looks upon him in mercy. 
And G Peter goes out and he weeps bitterly. Right? And more important than Peter's his repentance and his desire to the remorse that he feels is the mercy of Jesus. And that's what I want us to finish focusing on today. The prophetic word of Jesus and the merciful Lord. Right? And I mentioned already that in some sense, uh, here in this passage, and, and the reason I included the beating of Jesus at the end of this in verses 63 to 65, is because these fulfill things that Jesus has said about himself. So in that time, whenever Jesus issued his call to discipleship, right before that, Peter confesses this really important thing. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, okay, you're right. And the son of man is going to be rejected by the chief priests and the scribes and the temple officers and the elders, and he will be beaten and killed. Well, here we have the chief priests, we have the temple officers, we have the elders arresting Jesus and it, we're actually not told who. It just keeps on saying they. So presumably these are soldiers, but they are beating Jesus. So he's being fulfilled. What he said is being fulfilled in the moment. The fact that he told Peter, you will deny me three times before the rooster crows. And that happens, shows that Jesus is a prophet. And moreover than that, Luke wants us to know that he is actually speaking as God himself. Look at verse 61 again. It doesn't say Jesus turned to Peter. It doesn't say, and then Christ turned to Peter. It doesn't say the Nazarene turned to Peter. No, it says, and the Lord turned and, and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying, in the Greek, the word of the Lord, what would happen? Right, the word of the Lord, that's something that the prophets say. If you read Amos, Joel, Zephaniah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, whatever, they're going to keep on saying, thus says the Lord, hear the word of the Lord, O Israel. Peter remembered the word of God. He remembered the word that Jesus said spoke. So even in this scene of Peter's denial, our eyes are drawn towards the divinity of Jesus, that he is the Son of God. And just as Jesus, we remember that he is the lowly Lord who is about to be exalted. And again, so as the Lord, he is someone who we mentioned is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and, and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. And boy, is that something that Peter needs as he has fallen. He needs the mercy of the Lord. And we know that he receives Peter. Again, roll back the clock to verse 32 again. Verse 31, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I've prayed that your faith may not fail. Listen, and when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. So not only did Jesus' prediction involve Peter denying him three times, it also involved Peter's restoration. When you've turned again, when you've come back, that strengthen the brothers. And that's exactly what Peter does. Right? If we read John, the Gospel of John, right, that's where we have the biggest scene of Peter's restoration. John 21, verses 15 through 19, where three times Peter tells, or Jesus tells Peter, Peter, feed my lambs, care for the flock, feed my sheep. And then that's exactly what Peter does. Read the book of Acts in chapters 4 through 5. I think this is something that I've noticed as I've read the book of Acts. Whenever, if you read Acts carefully, through the whole thing, after the Spirit falls upon the church, what you, whenever you witness the disciples doing certain things, they're doing the works that Jesus would have done. Okay, so, you know, Peter, or Jesus very famously, has three big trials that he goes through in the next chapter. We'll look at that next week. But the Apostle Paul, in chapters 21 through 28 in Acts, goes through three trials where he bears witness to who Jesus is. I think there's a way in which... Peter and the apostles in Acts chapters 4 and 5, they heal someone in the way that Jesus would have healed them. And then they get arrested just like Jesus did, and they endured sufferings just like Jesus did. So Peter did not, he again, he did deny Jesus, but Jesus received him back mercifully, and then Peter went on to deny himself and to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. He went on to write a letter to discouraging Christian, to discourage Christians, and to tell them, endure, don't give up. If you suffered, it's a holy thing that God has called you to, to suffer for the name of Jesus. And he keeps pointing them back to the cross again and again and again. Again, just it's interesting to read all, like read, read this passage in light of first, the whole book of First Peter, or read First Peter in light of this passage. It's really striking. And so I think the call for us is to realize, how do we grow as disciples here? I want to think about what are the times in our life when we've been tempted to give up, to deny Jesus? Or even just to kind of hide the fact that we're Christians. 
right? I hope I go into this room and people don't notice that, you know, because it's going to mean that they're prejudiced against me or they'll look at me weird. When are we tempted? Are there certain people we realize that we're tempted to deny him around? The second question is, how have you, when, and this is again something you can reflect by yourself, spend time in prayer thinking about this question, when have you failed in your life, in your discipleship, and how did the Lord restore you? Now don't, 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 get, don't, don't do the first part of that and, and forget to do the second part. Think about both of those. How have you failed and how have you celebrated, how have you experienced the Lord's mercy and celebrated that? I've included in uh, on the Bible study notes today two things to kind of help us meditate on this. Um, one of them uh, is a prayer out of the Book of Common Prayer, uh, which is a, something that the Anglican Church uses. And it's just a prayer for Lent today and uh, for the season of Lent. And I thought it would be fitting for us to conclude by praying this. But also, I, there's a song that, I, that I've, it's been one of my favorite songs that I've learned over the last... I'll say four or five years, called His Mercy is More. His Mercy is More. And um, you can, if you look it up online, you'll be able to find it. We've sung it a couple of times here, but it's been a while. Um, I, I think the first time I asked Jonathan to sing it was like the first Sunday that we were in the CLC and uh, three years ago, and things, things were just a little hectic that Sunday. <laughs> so uh, it's been a long time. But it's a great song, and I'll just read the lyrics of the first verse and the chorus and again I encourage you to look it up and listen to it sometime uh, what love could remember no wrongs we have done omniscient all knowing he counts not their sum thrown into a sea without bottom or shore our sins there are many his mercy is more praise the Lord his mercy is more stronger than darkness new every morn our sins there are many his mercy is more it's a beautiful song. Um, but as we conclude, I want to I pray this prayer, um, which is printed on your, uh, on your Bible study to study notes. It says this, Heavenly Father, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. Look with compassion upon the heartfelt desires of your servants and purify our disordered affections, that we may behold your eternal glory in the face of Christ Jesus, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen.